again. Uh, we're going. Good afternoon. We are going to try this again. I hope you can hear me. Thank you for your patience. But this is 2020, so what can you expect? <laughs> uh, welcome to the Oral History Association 2020 Plenary with Mark Steiner and Dee Watkins. My name is Kelly Elaine Navies, and I am this year's program co-chair along with Shanna Farrell. Before we begin, I would like to thank some very important people who helped us to make this year's first virtual conference happen. And those people are, from our executive office, Christine Ms. Custer, Louis Kiriakoudis, Faith Bagley, our president, Allison K. Trailer, president-elect, Dan Kerr, Vice President Amy Starcheski, Linda Schopes and Catherine Mayfield of the Local Arrangements Committee, their entire committee did a fabulous job. And of course, uh, my fellow co-chair, Shanna Farrell, and the entire program committee, and Anna Kaplan as well. Um, all of us have been working very hard to bring this to you. Before the pandemic hit and the streets lit up with righteous protest in the wake of the murders of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and Ahmaud Arbery, Mark Steiner and Dee Watkins were chosen to headline this plenary. We knew we wanted to bring a program to the OHA that captured the rawness and beauty of Baltimore. And what better way to do it than to bring two Baltimore natives together whose life stories seem to embody that essence. One, an award-winning radio journalist who came of age as an activist on the streets of Baltimore where he was mentored by elder veterans of the civil rights era and the other, a New York Times best-selling author whose memoirs tell the story of a young black man who triumphed over the underground economy of drug dealing and crime to earn academic degrees in education and creative writing. As the unprecedented, devastating, and yet inspirational year of 2020 unfolded with its worldwide chant of Black Lives Matter against the backdrop of hospitals filled to the brim with COVID victims it became clear that our guest speakers would be even more relevant. Oral historians and others who are passionate about the power of story, I present to you Mark Steiner and Dee Watkins. Thank, Thank you. Kelly. Yee. Hey, thank you. <laughs> Happy to be here. Thank, thank you. Too. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so, um, let's start with uh, us. The whole thing won't just be about us, I promise. Let's just start with us. I mean, and. I think, starting back to how we actually got, the, the world's brought us together that we relate to the world we're talking about right now. You met on my show, right? Yeah, I know, like, so I knew who you were before, um, before you knew who I was. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I remember when, when I, I really, really, really started getting into writing and I started paying attention to what was happening locally on the political scene. And in general, I stumbled across your show. I can't remember who was the first one who said, you gotta listen to Mark Steiner. But I know I, I, it, was, it became a part of my routine. So when I would wake up early in the morning and I would try to get the writing done that I didn't finish the previous night, I knew break time would come <laughs> when it was time for me to come on your show and then I, I listened to some of the things that you were talking about, and I always liked how you would incorporate pieces of history in the show on this day, and, and I always liked how um, you, 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 would, you would play jazz, and I always thought you had great guests. So when the time actually came for me to come on the show, I was like, wait, what? <laughs> Somebody's reaching out to me for Mark Stein's show? He don't, don't even know I listen to him all the time, but that's, that's, that's love, so I got a chance to come on, and it was great. I got a chance to come on a couple of times, and bring some friends on and some other artists, and it was it was it was a great experience. I think um, the Mark Steiner show, the Mark Steiner show for me was um, the perfect example of, of the power of history and oral history, and how we can look at what happened in the past and then connect it to what's happening today, so we can move forward and not make the same mistakes. So it was, it was powerful. And the work you do, I mean, it is for the to know if you have not read these books, you should read these books. Um, these books, your, your books are oral history. Your books are telling the story of working class black communities in the streets in real time. It's not like this outside observer coming in to take a look. It, you, you got, was, was part of the corner, part of that life, how you got out of life, became a writer, um, 
no easy sojourn for any man or woman to make. But that, that is you. I mean, that's the world you grew up in. Yeah, I think I have a unique perspective because I, I got a chance to come from a home where everybody was in the streets. I had a chance to go on to college campuses um, where I was the only black guy and drop out because of that. I had a chance to work in a classroom as a teacher. I had a chance to hustle. I had a chance to be an unemployed guy, you know, filling out a thousand applications and nobody calling me back. Um, I had a chance to be, I had a chance to be extremely popular throughout this whole city, but be super poor at the same time. So like people asked me for an autograph and I can't even buy a sandwich. So, um, you know, so like I'll sign it, you know, I'll do the autograph and I'll have to trade for a sandwich. So, um, <laughs> so I had all of these different experiences and in those travels and in those, in, in those struggles and, and, and triumphs, I've met so many people and I was able to, to, to learn so much about myself and about the, the stories of other people and to be able to, um, to translate those for huge audience, audiences all across the world. Um, people who are just looking to gain greater perspective on how other groups of people live, which is the power of oral history. And I was thinking about what you just said, and uh, one of the things that popped in my head was that uh, there was an expression back in the day, um, in my day, um, that came out of the generation that gave birth to my generation. My generation. The, the generation gave birth to my generation. Yeah, I, I gave birth to your generation. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, that's you. <laughs> and, it was, and, and my first wife's father, his name was Willie Stone. He was a chef. And he was in the Navy in World War II. And, um, mm -hmm. and he, you know, it, being, and he was a black man from Augusta, Georgia. Mm -hmm. And he and his brother-in-law, Babe, who was a groom at the track, they wouldn't let black folks be trainers. They had an expression, they, I remember this conversation they had one night, and we were all hanging around, and, we, and, and they said, a man's gotta have his job, and a man's gotta have his hustle mm -hmm. to survive. And I remember we had this profound conversation for me to hear these men talk about this. And um, it, they didn't realize that now, which is why this world history is so important and telling stories is important, now we're in a world where a man, a person, has to have their hustle because the jobs don't pay enough. The jobs aren't there. We're in a really different world. You know, it's interesting how you reach that, tell those stories. I was, took my producers on a, um, uh, one of my producers, we were doing a story in East Baltimore about uh, people who were working with gangs on the corner on the, on the east side. And we drove past all these abandoned houses, you know, the houses are just boarded up and, and this is where people live in this dystopian kind of world. And I said, you know, when I was a kid, these houses were full of people. They were full of people with mothers, fathers, grandmothers, children living in these homes. People were poor, they were struggling, there was segregation, but people lived in these homes. Mm -hmm. And now that's gone. And now people did that, that so you have a world now that is like, that is imploded and people get stuck behind. And that's kind of that arc of the story. We hear about stories of activists. But it's important to hear the stories of the people talking about that story and people getting left behind and what that means for today and what we learn from that. You know, so I just, it just, it, it really hit me. I was, I was rereading and you know, listening to my old conversation with Studs Terkel about it. He was one of the greatest oral historians in America ever created the stories he told in his books. And those stories are really critical for us to understand who we are and why we are, right? Which is why there's not some shit stuff you like is really important. You know, it's crazy because you say, when you talk about those boarded up houses and them being full of people, my generation, when I was coming up in the 90s and early 2000s, a lot of those homes were boarded up, but a lot of them were still full of people. <laughs> because what has society left behind for them? And that's, that's, that's just a hard truth. Um, you know, I have these convers I have these conversations with people all of the time. Outside of the writing um, and the mentoring that I do for other artists, I'm still, in, I'm still connected to a whole lot of people who are still trying to find their way. And they're in their 30s, and they're in their 40s, and they're in their 50s, and they're still trying to find footing. And they don't want to be in the street. They don't want to do negative things, but it's a, a lot of them, it's almost nothing for them to do. And they've never been anywhere but Baltimore, and Baltimore is all they have. 
<laughs> but there's really nothing to, to offer a lot of people. So um, they, they're in that reality, and it's just, it's, it's tough. So how did, I mean, this about how those story types should be told, and I was thinking that, you know, I've been thinking a lot about how um, the end of segregation in our, in our, in our country, and being somebody who was part of the civil rights movement, the people, the ending segregation meant deindustrialization, which meant that millions of people got left behind because the jobs were gone and legal segregation ended, but that didn't end up because, because people had no jobs and they were stuck in these places and these neighbors were created with dystopian. People have to tell that, and the, only, and the only way this country could respond was not to create jobs and rebuild neighborhoods, but to create mass incarceration and start putting people in jail. Yeah, they do something. Right? As you said, that's what they did. So how do we tell that story? How does that story get told in terms of the people's voice to, 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 so people can understand what that means and what it means for this country to hear the people talk about the story? So I'm not a comedian. I'm not a comedian. You're try it. <laughs> I never, I never tried. I never tried. I never tried to do stand up. But perspective is something. Okay, so let me. I'll just tell the story. I was in Arkansas. And this is back when Al Jazeera used to do like a lot of, they had like the whole American news, uh, newsroom and all these things set up. So a producer from Al Jazeera called me to come on to, uh, to, a, to go to a TV station and, and record uh, to kind of like debate uh, some conservative guy who, um, I don't know what he did, but he was, he was like a conservative guy. And he, uh, I think he like taught criminal justice or something like that, right? So we're sitting on camera, and you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm listening to the moderator talk, and they're talking about violence in Baltimore and what's happening in the streets. So this conservative guy says, "Well, the problem," and this is like in 2015, just to give you some context. He said, "The problem is that the black kids in the inner city of Baltimore they don't want the factory jobs." And to work with steel and to work at the mills where they can get sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year, they want to sell crack in the streets for two hundred thousand dollars a month. And I can't hold my laughter because I'm like, well, where did this guy come from? Like, first of all, where are the factory jobs in Baltimore? That's A, right? A. B. Who's selling crack? Like, <laughs> like this is this is 2015. This isn't 1995. And, 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 and the biggest, the, 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 the big problem, the bigger problem is that this person has platform. This person has enough platform to get onto a news station to use his own version, his book version of oral history to tell people that the violence in Baltimore is to come from systemic poverty, systemic racism, black opportunity, and all these things that push black people out of the system. He said it's coming from greedy kids who want to make $200,000 a month. You show me these $200,000 a month kids. You know, before you start making claims like that. So these things happen when people from the community don't have the luxury of articulating what's happening in their own community or telling the story. And all of the two storytellers are actually people who are watching from the outside, so drunk on stereotypes of what they think people, how they think people are. Then you get these world realities out there that doesn't work. That's why oral history is so important. That's why you know we, we have to have proximity. To, 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 to the places and the people that we want to talk about or we'll never, ever, ever get it right. I think that if Americans understand what has to change and who we really are as a people, those stories have to be told. I, I did a series, um, 2006, seven called Just Words. And it was, it was doing our best to begin to tell the story of people the poor working class people in Baltimore, be they black, white, indigenous, Latino, whoever they were, but to tell their stories, to people hear the, the stories in their own words, understand where we are. And a young man who was then 25, his name was Walker Gladden, and um, he's, he, he, he came out of that and he fell back, and now he's back in it again, working to try to change things on the east side of Baltimore uh, at, the, at the Rose Street Center. But Walker and I really hit it off, and one of the things, and he was among the people. We recorded folks who worked in, in um, at the stadiums for like $7 an hour. We recorded grandmothers raising their children. We recorded people who were struggling to survive and how they were doing it, and in the stories of joy, laughter, and pain, and all the stuff they were doing. But Walker, this one piece we did with him, he was like the every man of the street. 
It's it kind of plays what you were saying. And I want you and everyone else to kind of hear Walker's voice and then we'll talk a bit about this. Welcome to Just Words, the stories of working people in our community. Walker Gladden is a former convict who served three prison sentences for armed robbery and drugs. He turned his life around at age 25 and is now the youth coordinator for the Rose Street Community Center in East Baltimore. He is devoting his life to saving young men and women from lives of crime and hopelessness. But he understands the gulf that separates boys and girls in the hood from the rest of the world. He speaks as the everyman of the inner city streets of Baltimore. I grew up in an environment, in a community, very dysfunctional because of crime, violence, homicide, drugs, everything was epidemic proportion. I didn't come up in this environment at the age of one year old. And now I'm 12, 15, 21. What am I afraid of now? I'm afraid of the things that I never really came into contact with. Citizenship, what is it? Going to school, I ran away from that as a youth. So now you're telling me, uh, what is getting a bank account? I have no idea, no clue. Matter of fact, uh, I'm thinking it's all right to drive without a driver's license. You're telling me to go get a driver's license at MBA. Uh, you're telling me about a birth certificate and social security card. Well, I never needed that before, so what you telling me I need that now for? So everything that's normal to society in terms of citizenship, I'm now developing a relationship with at the age of 25 years old. Now I got to take on all these obligations and responsibilities for these things that's already normal to the normal society, and I've been living in a dysfunctional environment all my life, and now I got to deal with these after being smothered underneath of all of that abnormal lifestyles and abnormal realities. I never knew none of those things. I'm feeling like, why have I been robbed from all these things? Why have nobody told me and shared? Talk about a job or whatever it may be. I never was before. I see other people working and how successful they are. Is it possible that I could be successful too? I don't see success too much. I see failure. I see death. Got 275 on the side here. I mean, these are the 275. I'm the 21 years old. I'm about 45. Uh, most of the young people that get killed, they don't get a chance to say, say these things to themselves. This is why I want to be up. Or what my purpose is. Or what I want to become. They die before they even get a chance. So you're talking about fear. We fear what's normal because we've been living an abnormal life for so long. That's the mindset of our young people in terms of developing a relationship with right living. Right, I've been living wrong all my life. Now you tell me I've been living right. Matter of fact, what is living right? I thought living right was to sell some dope so that my mom could eat some steak instead of eating pork and made some hot dogs. And these are the things that's missing. And these are the components that's absent out of the life of the majority of our young people uh, right here in our city. Last week, Walker Gladden. So, um, that's real. <laughs> That's real. <laughs> That's real. What would it mean if we actually were able to tell these stories and have the larger world understand and hear these stories? So a couple of years ago, I created something called the Baltimore Raiders Project, where I had some high school students, some from City, some from Ali, um, one from Dunbar, go into their neighborhoods and collect stories from people. And the cool thing about it is I gave them the option of using video, um, audio, and photography, and they got paid for everything that they did. And I was able to present some of their work um, to a class that I talked with, with Eric Rice, at, uh, I co-taught with Eric Rice at Johns Hopkins University. They got a chance to sit in on some of the classes, and I got a chance to present some of their work. And I put their work up on the website for people to see it. Um, but the thing is, is that it's kind of hard to run a program like that. I'm not like a big nonprofit, and I don't have like all types of funding. So a lot of the money that was used was my own money, but I wanted to make sure they got paid for every story. And they had so much fun being, you know, just little historians hanging out in their neighborhoods, 
the same stories that they love hearing, the same way I love hearing stories from people in the neighborhood when I was coming up. They got a chance to, to put them on film and edit them, and, and they got a chance to, to write about them and things like that, and it was, it was cool. But we, it, it need, it's something that needs to blow up, and we need to expand that, because like you already said, these stories need to be told. It's the only way we'll understand the entire picture um, of what's happening and leave something for the next generation to have so they can pour from. Because I, there's not an archive I can really pour from to learn about, you know, how my older brothers and them and my dad and all of them and, and the big homies and what they were doing and, you know, what they had to go through. I, I can't pour from that. That generation is lost. All I have is what's the music and then the newspapers. And if you know, like I know, uh, some of the stories in the newspapers are good, but some of them are just solely based on the perspective of that writer who is another person that might not really understand the community. Yeah, and I think one of the things that, that, that these why it's so important to do that kind of work and to bring those stories out for people to read, hear, listen to, watch in the voices of the people themselves is because, you know, we, we, we have all this rhetoric, that, not that it's a negative, it sounds negative, I mean in a negative way. We have all this rhetoric and, 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 and the political conversations um, about race and racism in America and what it's meant and what classism means and what it's meant, what's done to this country, and it's kind of, you see it's divided this country now, which we're not hearing each other, but that's why these voices are important, for people to hear it. You can't live it, you've got to experience it somehow. And experiencing it through the, the words and lives of people themselves, to me, is would be the work of, of, of people we want to call all historians and anthropologists to take it out of academia and put it into the real world. So people can actually hear what neighbors they don't even know exist are living through and experiencing and how they view the world. I mean, that, uh, that's what's missing. I mean, that could be a huge thing to me, it seems, in terms of, 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 of reaching a gap and getting people to hear other people. Even if you just like take the reality that Mr. Gladden just spoke about and you apply, because that's still happening to this day. It's still happening. Like, I, I still have friends who are just getting their driver's license. I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm fussing at them because I'm sitting in motor vehicles with them. And I already did that before. Like, I, you know, I, I don't, now I got to wait for you you take a Uber home. You know, it, what's that? You know, well, that's a hack, but it's an act. So, but you still have... It's a hack with that. Right. You still have, you still have people you still have people caught up in this reality, and if we think about COVID and what's happening right now, you know, and, 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 and people say, well, why, why is these group of people hanging in neighborhoods? How come they don't have masks on? That's the reality. I don't fear what you tell me to feel on the news because look how my world is. Look what's happening. We're talking about people dying, people dying. It, it, doesn't, really, it doesn't really translate and our lack of understanding allows for that disconnect to continue to happen. But we got to figure out a way to, to break it down because we do want people safe. We do want people to have an opportunity. We do want people to think that, you know, yes, you should have a mask on because we don't want you to die. We don't want you to die anyway, but we don't want you, you know, we don't want you to, to, to allow this thing to spread. And, and, and we can't have new conversations because we're not understanding the realities um, of each other enough. And you hear those, those, the stories, the realities that people have to live through is important. I mean, one of the things when you said mass, and you think about how um, there was a whole group of folks who was, were going down to uh, northern Pennsylvania, which for those who don't know Baltimore is um, the, the west side of the city. Um, Pennsylvania Avenue was Baltimore's 125th Street. It was Philadelphia's South Street. It was, it was, it was the center um, of the black world um, on the west side. And, but now it's like one of those communities that's been abandoned. And people were giving out masks to people coming out of the subway, walking the street corner. And one people, the conversations people had was like, was saying, thank you, we don't know how to get a mask. We don't know where to get a mask. There are no drugstores here. There are no supermarkets here. There's nothing here. I can't get a mask. And, and so it's like, you, you think that people are being nonchalant about it, but it's also that people have no access to it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you need like, even, so if I get my mask from, if I buy a case of masks from Amazon, okay, so you kind of need to have Wi-Fi or some type of smartphone to get internet access, and you got to have an app, and you got to have the ability to, to, you know, function in an app world, and you got to have some type of credit card. People don't have credit cards. People don't have smartphones. People don't have internet access or Wi-Fi. These aren't things that, things that a lot of us take for granted. These are things that people 
don't really have access to a lot, and I don't think it has shown any time more than now when we look at all the struggles going on with schools. And, you know, people trying to, to homeschool their kids, and so many kids are being left out because they even weren't able to get a hot spot, or the hot spot didn't work properly, or there's like five or six other kids in their home too trying to be homeschooled, and it's just, it's, it has been like a disaster. So even thinking about the ways we're going to fight our way out of this, and who is that brave young person who is going to tell that story? Oh, well, I can tell you about what happened in 2020, and I was trying to learn, and, you know, I didn't have this, or I didn't have that, or my teacher didn't really have the skill set, or the patience, or the resources to be able to, you know, handle these problems, and then we judge this kid, you know, against kids who have the perfect homeschooling setup, um, a beautiful room, space style, Wi-Fi that's, like, amazingly fast, bottled waters at the front door, <laughs> you know, a little bit of incense burning, like, you know, just like the perfect reality for homeschooling against the kid who's in the church just trying to figure it out. And we not, it's not even fair to even pit the test scores and the experiences against each other because it doesn't work. And it brings me back to when I was in school and they were trying to get me to read The Crucible or they were trying to get me to read Shakespeare and my classroom was two degrees and the teacher had a coat on, and the principal would walk the halls with a coat on. And every time we talked, you could see our, our breath because it was so freezing. But I gotta learn how to read this language that's not even, you know, accessible to, to children. You know, they, they're trying to teach it to us, but it's not like something we can pick up and grab about some people who have nothing to do with our reality. And then you judge us on this against people who understand art and culture and and, and have context into why these books are shared with them. <laughs> and, and, that's, and that's the game. And I think that's why these stories are really so important for people to hear. I mean, it, it's, you know, I, I think that when you talked about it right now we're in the midst of COVID, people don't realize that the, a, the huge percentage of young people, I talk to a lot of teachers. Teachers will say to me, maybe 15 students are showing up by Zoom because the others don't have access. They can't get into the internet. They cannot get into class. So why are we pouring massive amounts of money to help these children get what they need so they can stay up to par with the other students in, in our school systems? You know, I think that, and, and that, the stories are important because there was a book that came out in 1960, I believe it was, by Michael Harrington. It was called The Other America. And it was a book that changed the nature of how people thought about poverty in this country. Because he went, the other America to him was going everywhere from uh, black rural communities to inner city communities to re Native American reservations to the barrios where Latino lives in LA and other places. And he, t and he told the story. And people began to go, oh wait a minute, you, you mean the, 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 the American dream of, 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 of uh, Dick and Jane and Spot the Dog um, is myth, that there's more out there than that. So, you know, and I think that, that the job is, as a writer, as someone who lets people tell their stories on, on the air, is to tell, let, have those stories come out there in a major way so people can understand what it means and who people are, what they think, what they feel, what their hopes and dreams are, and it, it's not there. Yeah, and what it does, it allows you to understand, oral history allows you to understand that your only reality, your reality isn't the only reality. <laughs> because you, you can't fully love people, you can't fully connect with people, you can't fight to try to make our country better if you think your reality is the only reality. Um, the perfect example is our current president. He thinks his reality is the only reality. So, and I'm not even going to talk. reality show. <laughs> I'm not even going to talk about the, 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 the 10 million thing, the 10 million negative things that come to my mind when you think of him. But something very simple as him telling people that Corona is not that serious. He actually feels better that he has it, and you know he has everything you need to be taken care of while people are still dying. You know, why he knows, why we know, and he knows that he has access to the best medicine, the best care, ventilators that we probably haven't even heard of, all types of technology, 
based on making sure he's okay and then acting like everybody else has these things and then taking his mask off and talking over people and spreading it to people who support him um, or journalists who have the horrible job of covering that administration. So, you know, that is what you look like when you jump out there with perspective and ideas and not take any time to understand that other perspectives and ideas exist. And that's, that's just the power of storytelling. And it's what I try, what I try to do in my work. Uh, I don't ever try to preach or be didactic and just try to tell people how they're supposed to feel. I just say, look, there's a situation. This is how it played out. Um, maybe you'll laugh, maybe you'll get inspired, but hopefully you think and you say, wow, I never looked at it like that or I never thought about it like that. Um, maybe I can add my own experience to it and then we'll have great conversations that'll push us all forward. Right, and I think that, 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 that there's the power of the work. I was thinking about how, um, <laughs> leaving Trump out of it for a minute, I wish we could leave him out of a period, but anyway, um, well, that's another conversation. <laughs> uh, but um, well, I was th thinking about when people hear stories, one of the things that happens that I've discovered is people find their commonality as well. They don't just discover a new world, new perspective, but it's a commonality. It's people finding out that's the same struggle I have, and maybe a little bit different, nuanced differently, um, that racism and the certain divides make the stories different, the experiences different, but they're the same and they're connected. And that's the thing that, that I think people really, really don't get, is how we're really connected. And the stories allow us to connect, right? It's not, and, and, and every story isn't like a, like a woe is me story, just dealing with reality. And, and I, I think we, we do connect to that. I mean, you, you hear, you, I mean, you find that in your work teaching kids, right? Yeah, um, how, to, how to navigate this world, um, how, to, how to deal with your own insecurities. Um, it's with something that we all share. How to, how to feel like um, you do matter is something that we all share. Um, in different ways to think about it, and in different ways to acknowledge people. I think it's, I think it's extremely important. Um, memoir in general does that. It, it kind of identifies those universal truths that connect us all, and it, and it makes the world smaller. And it's, 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 it's why I like it so much. Actually, in your work, this, this is the thing about that. In, in your, your work, no matter what you do when you're writing, it's a little bit of memoir. Yeah. Yeah, I, I got to. Um, history, too. Like, I got I use, you know, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I went to school for undergrad. My, my BA is in history. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a historian uh -huh. at, at art. Like, even, like, back, you know, when people used to go to bars and stuff, I would introduce myself as an amateur historian. No, I, I, never, <laughs> I never did that. I never did that. <laughs> but, no, I love history. I love the Reconstruction era. Um, care about it a whole lot. Think about it a lot. Um, and how even the way we look at it, came down to a matter of perspective and what historian, you know, W.E.B. Du Bois versus the Dunning School and how, you know, he was able to, to, to challenge the, the narrative that was being put out there uh, to have it be the reconstruction that, that we look at today. So I, I think about that and when I'm, when I'm writing a personal essay or when I'm writing or responding to a political topic or something like that, you know, I like to, um, I like to talk about where I come from or something that I've been through, but then I like to put that experience into a historical context. And when you merge the two, it's very, very easy for you to lead into some analysis on options or solutions that we can use to, um, to move forward. And when you said that, this is a total digression, but you made me think of history, people don't get it. And when we think about how race and racism has defined this country uh, and our consciousness and our unconscious mind, um, we don't know our history either. I was thinking about Marcus Redeker is a great historian. And one of the things he's, one of the, he did for a while, he was really focused on pirates. And uh, his books about the, the, from the 1600s to the late 1700s, it focused on this, and the time of enslavement and slave trade, but also of the commerce, what was going on, and the role the pirates played. People don't realize it. If you watch movies, you would never know it. One third of all the pirates were black. Mm. Now, you would, have we ever seen a black man pirate in a movie? 
Yeah, right. I need to talk to Johnny Depp, man. <laughs> I mean, and, 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 and other pieces of stories, when you, when you look at the stories people told about the Old West, again, one quarter, at least one quarter of all the men who drove cattle were black. Mm. But you look at the way we do things in the world, we don't know. That's why these, it's important to get these stories out. We have to understand who we are and who we've always been. And we and you and you, you got to understand you know that, that's something that we miss we don't we don't get it because racism has torn it asunder and taken it away from us and I think our job in our different roles in this world of telling people stories is to bring that back is to make people see the stories hear the story understand the story so we need to think differently about who we are as Americans yeah because you know we want as as Americans we basically kind of want the same thing. You know, we want to be free. We want to experience social mobility. We want to make our families proud. We want to put our kids in positions to do amazing things. And that's, you know, you can be from East Baltimore like me, or you can be, you know, some type of middle America guy with a Trump sign in your yard. You know what I mean? You want, you want to have success. You want to be happy. You want to experience love. These are like basic human things. These are basic things that we want. And those stories are the only thing that can that can connect these all of these different these these different people from these different walks of life. And you were talking about Trump story, Trump. I made me think of I know a lot of people who uh, who are backing Trump. Um, I've run into them and I've had conversations with them. And I live in a community where there are a lot of Trumpies. What are they talking about? Like, how do they? What's wrong with them? <laughs> oh Lord have mercy. Um, <laughs> I'm confused. <laughs> but what I but I to have their story told for me is A understanding who these who folks are as human beings and how good and kind people can be and be twisted by this world and how this America can be twisted by the, the, who we, what, what our foundations of this country created. And to me, it's, it's a matter also the, the conscious and unconscious mind that people have and how it's been infected. And I'll go back to race, how it's been infected by racism. And hearing those stories, the more you hear their stories, the more I think you can begin to bridge those stories. I never, I never remember, I forget, Fannie Lou Hamer, who was, uh, uh, of course, one of the, the, the great civil rights mm -hmm. sheroes um, in our history, and who had beaten and tortured by the police in Mississippi, sharecropper, thrown off her land, all, you know, and uh, most of you know who she is. If you don't, you should definitely check out Van Hamer's life. But one of the things that happened, she just started organizing workers' co-ops in Mississippi. And at one point, someone said to her, because these white folks, there was a bunch of white folks involved as well, from farmers from Mississippi, and she said, somebody said to her, you can't have those people working with us. And they said, why? She said, because, because those people are in the Klan. And Fannie Lou Hamer's words were, and I think I have this quote right. She said, baby, once they finish working with us, they're not going to be in the Klan anymore. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget that line, because it makes me think of people, we talk about people who are voting for Trump and how race plays into that. It's a matter of the disconnect. And our stories, I think, going back to that, not being it, it, it can connect us, you know, to, to understand we are, yeah, racism changes the nature of the struggles we have, but we also, as human beings in this country, are connected by the stories we have, and find we're not that different. You know, and I think that's, they had some, I, mean, I was thinking about this, and I was, I had a, um, um, a, the, the water line in my house broke between the house and, and, the, and the well, and so we couldn't get any water, and so, Call a contractor and ten thousand dollars is issue. I don't think so. I'm not paying ten thousand dollars. Where's my pickaxe? So, um, but my neighbor had his Trump hat on. He came over. He dug that trench with me. Did he have to wear the hat? He was wearing his hat. <laughs> I, I went and got my. Like, little, do you dig better with the hat? No, Did but you go I, get an Obama T-shirt. Get, get my little Obama and Bernie <laughs> stuff and put that on, you know. And and, and, say, and but I think. And we have these conversations just about, you know, and that begins the conversation. But he's a good soul, and 
you've got to reach into that and pull it out. If you pull out his stories and you tell your stories and you be that see, to me there's a connection between telling stories and oral history and community organizing. And having been an old community organizer, that's part of what I see. Part of organizing is telling stories and hearing people's stories and how that changes humanity. Part of effective organizing is also giving people the space to grow. Yeah. Maybe they're in a space right now and he doesn't really understand. He knows how to you know, dig a hole, but he doesn't really understand how to pick a president. And, <laughs> and maybe he needs to understand how this person has been responsible for so much pain and has hurt so many people and for whatever shallow reasons you cling to this, you know, isn't really worth the hundreds of thousands of lives that have just been lost because of lies and a person who's just not responsible in, in a position that they don't deserve. And that is a very unpopular opinion, talking to that person and having that conversation, but it is the only way we will fix this place. Until that person with that hat understands that he has more in common with the people suffering then he has in common with the actual person who he's voting for, then, you know, until we get on that wave, we'll always bump heads and things won't move the way they're supposed to move. Because we're on a precipice and we don't know which way we're gonna go. And so we're in a very dangerous moment in this country. It makes me think of, you know, that's why, again, going back to the th things we were talking a little bit, about, that, that um, I interviewed a lot of people who worked in cataloging and telling the stories out of slave narratives. And um, those are important because they, if you listen to those stories, those stories are the root and help us define where we are now. We understand more about who we are now by listening to those stories from then. Mm -hmm. And, and for all of us to hear that, and, for, and not, not, not just those stories, the, the stories of the, uh, you know, I mentioned earlier Studs Terkel. Uh, I had real pleasure and, and distinct honor to get to know him really well. Um, and uh, interviewed him nine times. Mm. And um, that's what he did. He collected stories. But he didn't just collect stories. He shared the stories he collected with the people from whom he collected them with. So that somebody on the black south side of Chicago is gonna hear somebody on the north side of Chicago, poor white, poor black, hearing each other's stories, knowing the common struggles. And that's one of the ways you overcome racism. That's one of the ways you overcome the disunity. And he did that, you know, and he was really, it wasn't just a chore of telling stories for him, he was doing that to make a difference. And I think that's, Maybe this is my political nature talking, but I mean that to me, is, collecting those stories for me is a is a is a political act. It's a human act. It's an act to bring people together, have to hear each other, and that's what we don't do enough of. We don't hear each other. It's the job of of, of the people that have platforms, um, you and me included, to make sure we're elevating and sharing those stories. You know, um, it's because even like in the world that we live in right now, stories. People have learned how to transform their story into currency. And when I look on the internet and when I look at people talking about certain things and certain situations and, and what's happening out here, it's almost like a lot of times looking at like an oppression Olympics. <laughs> Everybody's trying to say who's been through the most so right. they can get to it instead of focusing on um, those connectors that we should be looking for. I saw um, I saw a guy write this long post about, um, you know, he was like, I had to sit in the jail cell for 16 hours. <laughs> and I was like, wow. <laughs> and I'm not saying that was fun, but I mean, you got people that did like 30 years, you know what I mean? Like for something that they didn't do, you know, it was like, it was so cold in this cell for 16 hours. And I'm like, okay, um, yeah, so, you know, and that goes back to writing about getting stories and separating and separating the difference between who's playing and who's not playing and, and being able to just have these things exist in the world because people deserve to know that too.
right. I, and that, I was in 16 hours. Right? <laughs> Try 16 years in Seattle. I mean, you know, Eddie Conway. You know what I'm saying? Like, for crimes that you don't commit. Like, right. Mr. Lomax. You know who wants a Lomax? You know, he, he said 27 years and he, he still, for a crime he didn't commit. And he, like he did not commit and he, at and all. And he still has a sense of humor. Right. And I was like, wow. You know, that, so, I just, what popped on my head as you were saying that was I, I was um, um, reading this morning because it just popped up something happened and something I was looking at and I started doing, thinking about it's Umbutu, which is this is in the, among the many Bantu-speaking people, the Xhosas and others, and Shonas. It's a, it's a way of um, it's a way of dealing with transgressions inside the community, where people are commit the transgression are put in a circle literally for whatever period of time and people tell them all the beautiful things about them the people who committed the transgressions and I was thinking about that and how um, we were talking about the, the 60 the year 16 hours made me think of this and how we this mass incarceration we talked about much earlier with which is the only response America had to the, the impoverishment of, of black Americans um, and it, it, we, and you should think about like the, the, the Lakota, the stories I collected, um, well actually they weren't Arapaho, but the, the, the part of the whole the, the culture, um, where the, the, when, the, when the Americans forced the Lakota and Arapaho onto reservations, there was this confrontation uh, where Crow Dog, who was, who, was a, who was a Lakota leader, killed um, one of what they called the Round the Fort Indians who was doing all the work for the, for the Americans, had a, a beef. And it was a famous court case because the Americans wanted to execute him. The Lakota said, no, we're going to do it our way. And their way was he had to support this family for the next two generations and had to leave the res, had to leave the land uh, for several generations. And, and the co-dogs came back. And I'm saying that to say the Maori is stuff with, with a sort of justice. We have to tell those stories about how other cultures deal with transgressions to make us think about different ways we deal with transgressions as opposed to just imprisoning people. I mean, you know a lot of folks have been locked up. I know a lot of folks have been locked up. My time, the, the cats in the corner I grew up with or when I worked in the prisons for two years, I came to the conclusion, you know, like 90% of the people in jail don't have to be there. Biggest problem with American culture is we, you know, sometimes, or too many times, act and think like we can't learn from other culture. But it's something that we all can agree on is that how we incarcerate people in this country does not work. It's a failed system. It, it doesn't work. How we police in this country doesn't work. It's a failed system. It doesn't work. It does not produce the results that you you would think it would produce. And the victims still don't feel supported. So you are failing across the board. <laughs> right. How do we enhance? How do we challenge that and make these systems work better for people? How do we utilize? Um, other nations and some of the success that they've had to try to um, clean up our dirty systems. So that's the conservation doesn't work. Death penalty doesn't work. Policing as it stands doesn't work. It, it, none of it works. None of it works. <laughs> none of it works. And, and the mass incarceration ends up being, ends up dominating the culture of the street and massing itself as culture when it's just the joint coming outside. Because we're not it, 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 it creates even more chaos. And I think that's why, again, going back, the stories are so important. These stories have meaning and these stories really can change people because if people really listen, I have a part of that storytelling. Storytelling is part of who we are as human beings and that's, people have to hear them. Yeah, me and you were walking down the street. You don't know what we do or what we're into, right. but if you got a chance to talk to us and hear us talk about our stories, then, you know, it would make for a great, a cup of coffee or a cocktail. And we got stories. <laughs> we got some. We got some stories. <laughs> yeah, we got stories, and I think that's that's you know I think that that's part of our role, both you as a writer, and and to be on the air is to let people tell their stories and tell our stories to transmit those stories to the, to the mediums we have to give to a broader audience. Which is why I think, I mean, the work in the they did on public radio all that time. Part of I saw. My job was to bring the stories of people they, that they, that audience doesn't hear, so they hear it. Yeah, and you did it.
Madam. Oh. <laughs> so at this time, we have a few minutes to take questions. So if you have questions, you can put them in the chat function there, and I will monitor the questions. I will start by just asking, first of all, thank you. This has been a great discussion. Thank I've you. really been enjoying it. And I, I have a question that I think is probably on the minds of a lot of the oral historians out there. So and it has come up in different discussions this week. So if you're an oral historian and you have a desire to go into one of the communities that you two have been describing, to, to get those stories told of young people, for example, who don't have Wi-Fi access, or the other people that, you, that we've been talking about here, what advice would you give an oral historian who wants to develop a community project but they need to gain the trust of the community? And there are a lot of different issues. Okay, so I actually just did it in an essay that I wrote. Um, I'm, I'm from East Baltimore. I was covering and working on a story about this cop who harassed me and people I knew for a really, really long time. And I went into his community. I didn't know anybody. I didn't have any connections. I don't even go on this side of town. But I went into the bar where he hangs out at, and I started talking to people. And the first night, they wasn't really feeling me. And I went back, and I went back again, and I went back again. And by the second week, I made like three or four friends, and I got a whole ton of stories that helped me out for my piece. So I would say, if you have interest in covering any neighborhood or any group of people, then you have to you have to build that relationship. And you can be honest. You go in there and say, look, this is who I am. This is what I'm trying to do. This is what I've worked on in the past. This is what I'm trying to create. Can we talk? And maybe the first person or the second person or the third person won't talk to you, but somebody's going to talk to you, and you're going to get those stories that you need. I guarantee, I guarantee that. And, and I, I think that one of the things that one of the keys that I learned, and I really learned this only 20, 25 years ago to really think what it means to get us to, 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 to be trusted, um, is I, I was in, um, uh, I was doing this work for the Hopkins Center for American Indian Health, and we were in this big circle talking when we were shooting us with camera. And, um, and the question was, what is communication? And everybody, most white people and most black people in the room, had these long answers about communication. Almost every native person said the same thing. One word, and the word was listening. Mm. And I think that, that was one of the, one of those, you know, we had these epiphanal moments. That was an epiphanal moment for me, you know, just to just understand that when you go into communities and, and, tell, and when you hear people's stories, you just don't always have to ask questions. You can throw things out and get things started, but you just listen. Listen to what people say. Follow them. Let them tell the story and you can help bring more out, but you have to listen. Still waiting on questions, but I have another thought. Someone uh, mentioned that Dr. Michael Oleska had students in his classes share stories about their grandparents, mm. and that helps the students um, realize that they have different things in common. Uh, I had a slightly different experience when I was teaching high school about 15 years ago in Washington, D.C., um, in Southeast D.C., and when I brought up the subject of oral history and asked them to interview people, they said they didn't know anyone over 50. This mm. was, so, I mean, there are different... Wow. And it was heartbreaking, but this, but to a student, they were like, Miss Navies, I don't know anyone over 50 in my community or in my family that I can interview. So these are some of the obstacles that, that we're facing. Maybe you want to speak on that. Yeah, I think, uh, I mean, that's, that's, that, that's a real thing. I think that the people who they may know that are over 50 might not be willing to talk because they're so guarded and, and they have a wall up. And what I will say, is and what I say to young people who uh, who I teach at the University of Baltimore when I have them out doing assignments that requires them to talk to other people, especially people from different generations, is is this is the real world. This is your assignment. Uh, you gotta you gotta crack it and you gotta figure it out. Like I understand that there's gonna be some obstacles, but guess what? This is just how life works. <laughs> like everything's not gonna fall in your lap and. Everybody's not going to be willing to talk, but that doesn't make you exempt from trying to complete the task. Sometimes you set out to do these things and you can't, maybe you can't get what you need in 2019 or 2020. Maybe you might not get what you really, really need to make it happen until 2024 or 2025. And that's just, that's how life, and that's how, that's how work is. I think we're living in a time where everybody feels like everything is so instant, and it's just not. Some things just take time. I have 
three questions now. Okay. Uh, sometimes there are gaps between community organizers, storytellers, story collectors. How can we close those gaps, and what would it mean for the potential of those stories for making change? Um, my first response to that would be um, is to really listen to the stories you've collected and find the connections and find the disconnections, the disconnects and the connections. And out of that, you get a whole story. I mean, everybody's, one of the things you, as, as somebody who collects the stories is, is you can't, you can't make judgments about the stories. The people are telling you stories from their reality. That's their reality. That's how they view the world. That's how they view their lives and what's happened around them. And you, and I've done this, I mean, you've got to piece together pieces that, that, um, that, that, that are the connective tissue that say this is where these things touch. And then explore why the disconnection happened. And then bring it back together. I mean, it's a, it's a process. And it takes, again, careful listening to what you've just done. And then figure out a, a creative way how you tell that story, which is, you know, as a writer, you have to do that too. You have to find those, and I think that's, to me, that's how you do it. And it's, not, it's no easy task. Right. I would also say, sometimes you're not going to be able to close gaps, but your job is to just tell the truth. Right. Tell the truth. Right. Um, right. Sometimes this group, like I, like I said, when you look at modern, famous celebrity activists, like this, celebrity activists is a thing. When you look at celebrity activists, nine times out of ten, they have no connection to no community outside of Twitter. And I'm not saying that what they do on Twitter isn't important because maybe, you know, they've connected some people or spread some knowledge or use their platform to bring awareness to an issue. But that type of activism doesn't a lot of times connect to direct service, helping people. How can a kid figure out how to do a resume? How can the kids figure out who can babysit their kids so that they can get a job? Where's training? Where's access to resources? Where's funds? These things don't, these two worlds are different and we just, as oral historians or storytellers in general, we, we just gotta tell the truth. We just gotta tell the truth because people need to understand that just because somebody has elevated to like a, you know, some type of pundit or something doesn't mean that every single last black person is like, like over the last week we have, um, I have people um, texting me and asking me about um, my thoughts and feelings on um, Ice Cube and his movement and what am I doing? And I'm like, yo, I don't know Ice Cube. I don't know his movement and he don't speak for me. And I, as far as a contract with black America, I, ain't, I didn't sign a contract. I got lawyers and agents. Like, what are you talking about? Like, <laughs> What are you talking about? Like, I don't have no idea what you're talking about, but yet we live in this bubble where as storytellers, everybody <laughs> run into everything general and they're thinking that everything's connected and it's not. And that's why we got to work hard at telling a real story. And I, could, I, I just conclude very quickly with <laughs> community organizers and people in the community and stories is that for the most part, most community organizers are not indigenous to the communities they're organizing in. Some are, but most have not been. Mm -hmm. And so they bring a perspective that's much, a broader perspective, a larger perspective from outside. Not more important, just broader. And people from the, from the community have their perspective from what they experience every day and what their reality is and what they have to face. And you have to make the connection between the two. Again, I go back to that. You have to make that connection. This is how they fit together. This is how they explain one another. Here's one. Um how can archives reach out and connect to journalists and writers like you two? Most of the people who wanted to interview me, um, who weren't in media, they just um, sent me direct messages on Twitter or Instagram or they just emailed me. And I'm always down to contribute and help with projects. Sometimes I, I get a little busy, but at the same time, um, I'm always down to connect and collaborate and, and have these conversations. But I would say just be bold in your attempt. Like, let that person know what you want and what it's for and what you're trying to do. And a lot of times, um, everybody's not going to play ball, but a lot of people will. I'm about to say I have a related question. Yeah. You know, as someone who manages an oral history initiative, so what would it take for you to come to our website, for example, to look for an oral history? Like, what would attract you as a writer or a journalist? Depends on what I'm working on. So if I'm working on something that I need as a perspective that I couldn't find from a person um, near to or connected to any networks where that I pursued, then I would I would go to um, 
I would just go any and every way I could get that information. And I think that if more people knew the resources that you know the museums have, then I think people will be more at, at, at to check them out. That's a really hard question. I mean, I, you know, it, it's it's. Um, It, I mean, there's no easy access. You have to actually do a lot of research and reading and looking. Now we have the web on, to to um, to find out where these things are. I mean, how you find out where the public information is and what and how, what you have to do to dig it out. I mean, that's that really isn't an easy thing. That's that's a really difficult thing. Here's one, uh, and it's about programming. And you two were talking about some programming that you're in, that's in development. So this relates to that before we went on the air. Is there any programming for people to build upon related to uh, in inter entertainment media like The Wire or Henrietta Lacks, projects you might be working on that are related to some of the issues we've discussed here today? Hmm. You want to go first? Um, I, yeah, I, I, I mean, our personal projects? You can, you can talk about personal projects or any other projects. I mean, I, I think that, uh, I mean, The Wire, you said The Wire. I what did David. you think of The Wire? I, 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 well, I love David Simon, and I think he, and I've known him for a long time. I think he's great, and I think The Wire was an amazing piece of work. And I've said this to him um, that I thought that The Wire um, lost a layer, and that's the, that's 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 the story part. That's the people story. The layer you lost was humanity in the inner cities, the humanity of the people who live there. That who they are in an emotional sense and in a, in a, in a sense of, of who they love and what they love, as opposed to just, oh, it was sometimes a little too much from the police side. And I thought that that, that was one of the, that was one of the short, but other than that, it opened America's eyes to stuff they'd never seen before. So David Simon did an incredible job <clears throat> with The Wire. Um, and, um, uh, but you know, I, what am I working on? What am I working on? I'm working on a bunch of things. I mean, um, I'm working on a historical piece. I can't interview those people anymore because they're all dead. Um, but, um, it, they, they, but I'm finding pieces, and maybe, maybe, maybe your museum actually has some of this stuff. I can, we'll find out. And there's the Christiana Rebellion, which is the most important piece in American history that people don't know about. Um, that was the first shot of the Civil War. That was about black militias defending people who were enslaved or ran away. It involved every major figure from Francis Guy Key's grandson to, to uh, uh, Thaddeus Stevens to, Jane, to John Brown to Harriet Tubman um, to, 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 to Lincoln's assassin, John Wilkes Booth. Uh, but I mean, there are, that's one of the things I'm working on. And, and, uh, um, and I have been kind of trying to collect stories of people now. I'm starting to go back to collecting stories of people. There's one thing, to give you one quick thing, there's something that we never we don't have time to talk about this, but back in my day, uh, we used to say that even the um, even the thugs were clean, right? <laughs> I mean, when I was growing up, people were jitter hoppers, their shoes were shined, their creases in their pants. Uh, you might have had 22 inch cuffs, but you were clean, right? Um, and I'd love to see conversations take place, and I've talked to a couple of old heads about this, and getting some younger guys in a conversation about the, what changed, what what happened in society then and now that makes that so vastly different and hear those stories come out. Um, so there's a bunch of things like that I'm working on. So I'm, I'm working on a book about about masculinity and about preparing to, to be a father and what that looks like. And I get to tie in um, just a lot of storytelling, a lot of experiences I had with, with my dad. Um, and then the multiple dads I had in response to all of the different ways I was raised around the city and, and through different through the streets and, and programs and, and stuff. And you were like a new that. dad. <laughs> and then and then we closed with <laughs> me taking taking these things um, into being a, a father. And then I'm also writing Carmelo Anthony's book with him. Ah. So we're talking about um, him moving from New York to Baltimore when he was eight years old and some of the trauma and some of the things that he saw in this city. Um, and then going away to college and being forced into adulthood instantly. Um, not even really getting a chance to have those. I'm gonna figure it out years because he was on this path to be this um, this role model for everybody. <laughs> so I'm, I'm working on that. And then um, 
speaking of the why, I'm working on a, a television show with, with David Simon um, about uh, it's, it's a it's a Baltimore story, but that's that's kind of all I can I can say about it without getting like a, a text or like a call from like a lawyer. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, <understand. laughs> I love it. That's great. So we have a couple more minutes. Do you two have a couple of closing thoughts that you'd like to share before we wrap this up? Yeah, I think um, I think these conversations are, are healthy, and, and I think that they're necessary. Every time I sit down with Mark, I always walk away with some gems, and like I, I learn some things. And I think um, we, we we need to bring this back. This just this, this exchange of ideas, and and, and 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 him telling me about you know how people around the city dressed and moved in, in the language and the slang and things that happened over his time period. And then me being able to compare it to my time period. And then younger people even coming in and telling me the bottom one that they know, which isn't the bottom one that I know, which isn't the bottom one that Mark knows. And I think it's like so healthy and um, I think it's necessary. And I guess I would just close with, um, given where we are, and the audience we can't see but who's watching, <laughs> and part of the oral yeah, historian's yeah. world is that, um, I think that, that um, just like anthropologists, um, they created a new school of anthropology, a new way of doing it called applied anthropology, which was like taking the work and making it relevant to this moment. I think that the incredible work that people who do who collect stories needs to be made relevant to this moment and for people to really hear those stories to begin to affect our consciousness. Um, and museums can do it. and and short audio packages can do it, and books can do it, and just really making it, those stories are our stories, but the stories you tell, the people tell are the things that molded us, and that will mold the generations to come. And I think that's kind of really important thing about our work is applied work, in terms of how it affects people around us. Well, I would like to thank you both for a dynamic conversation, and thank the audience for joining us. I think I have one other announcement. Yes, um, our next plenary that was scheduled for Saturday has been canceled, unfortunately, due to unforeseen circumstances. But enjoy the rest of the conference, and hopefully you can join us for tomorrow's keynote at 1.30 with Joyce Scott. Thank you. Sure.